I'm in. I'm live. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, I'm Jared Goldberg and, you know, I'm just home after the World Cup season. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I'm uh, finally getting to work on my own skis. Uh, you know, during the year, we usually have our World Cup technicians uh, that are taking care of, you know, upwards of 50 pairs of skis a year. Um, but I did have to tune my skis for a long time in order to get to the World Cup. So probably till I was around 20 or so, 2021, 20, uh, before I started having a professional tech. So um, I do have a lot of knowledge from, you know, since I was seven years old, I was tuning my skis and uh, not as much as, as some because I grew up at Snowbird where we had a lot of powder but <laughs> and a lot of soft snow. But uh, we did have to tune a lot um in the noram years and and uh europa cup and whatnot so uh i'm uh excited to show you guys some things that that i just do on my skis normally um this is something that i would be doing anyway uh it wasn't wasn't a big stretch to uh spider asked me to come do this and and uh it's no biggie for me because this is stuff that i got to do anyway and and uh so i'm just this is totally just going to be showing you guys uh what i do on my skis i'm going to be getting a pair of my GS skis ready for the summer. Just, uh, you know, put them in the basement and you know, they're looking pretty dry right now. So um, probably can't see that well, but uh, they're, they're bone dry. These things haven't been waxed way too many days. Uh, when I'm home, I, I usually like to just ski and not worry about my skis uh, during the winter. But uh, yeah, these need, these puppies need some wax. And, uh, and I got a couple other things I'm going to be doing. So uh, if you guys have any questions while I'm going, uh, you can put them in the comment section below. And uh, Max from Spider is going to be reading them off to me. So uh, if you guys have anything, ask away. It could be about tuning, about about anything, about uh, the World Cup, life, anything. So uh, go ahead. And this is Tunes and Brews. So I'm going to be drinking uh, a Uinta 801, one of, one of my favorite beers. And so let's get going. Mm. Yummy. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take a stone. I have some rust on these edges because I probably didn't wipe them down well enough when I was done skiing on them. Uh, they're not my race skis. Don't worry. These are an older pair of race skis. So uh, they're kind of, they're my training skis. And uh, so first I'm going to take a, a, a 200. And these are pretty good stones. They're Moonflex. These are like my favorite ones. Uh, I've had these for a long time. They're pretty, they're really durable. So I'm just going to kind of, you can kind of do whatever you like to do. Um, but I, I used to, I like to hit it with a 200 first and, and then a 400. And then um, this is like a really light, probably like a 1000 almost. So I'm probably just going to start with this, take off the big burrs in the rust because there's a couple places that have a lot of rust. So and I like to do it by hand. So just run it down the base. And then I'm going to run it on the edge side of the ski. And this is definitely a technique that takes a lot of time to, to figure out. So if you don't really totally know what you're doing, I would start with, uh, I would use one of these file guides. And this is um, a 92 degree, which is actually not what I'm going to use on these because... My, not, my dad took a 93. So usually I'd use a 93 on the GS skis and the other, my free skis, I use a 92 degree on the side. So I'm just gonna do it by hand for this one. Got some rust right here. So I'm just gonna go back. I'm not pushing that hard. Just going back, back and forth pretty lightly. really lightly on the base. You definitely don't, uh, you don't want to ruin the bevel. If you, if you push too hard on the bottom of the base, then it's going to start bending the bevel and it's going to give you too much bevel and you're going to feel like you have no edge. So it's super important to just kind of run it along because when you're, especially when you're pushing hard and when you're filing, with one of these file guides, it's going to create a little bit of 
a, uh, a hanger, we call them. And the hanger will actually be like right off the ski. So if this is the base, when you push really hard with the file, it's going to create a little bit of an, a lip that's like microscopic lip. And we can feel that by taking our nails and you can go up, push your nails up this way and it's going to grab that lip. And what's sometimes when it's really icy, you need to leave a little bit of a lip. But if you leave too much, then it breaks off and you feel like you're skiing on butter knives. So that's not something we want. So it's going to go nice and lightly on the bottom. Jared, uh, Mike is asking, uh, could you use a gummy stone for that or is that something different? Can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, the, you wouldn't want to use a gummy stone for that because that would actually make your, it would mess up your base bevel. Uh, the best way to use the gummy stone is, and the way that I've always used one, is just on the, on the tail and on the tip. And what it does is it just frees up, it allows the, the ski to move more free. So it was something that they did back on straight skis, right? So you really needed to, to use the gummy uh you could like use it all the way to here or here and like to just to get those straight skis to move but nowadays you don't really no one really uses it as much um for doling their tips way back or tails so i just do the the contact point so like right where it bends is all i do tip and tail and i've noticed that it's the only way that i can feel like i'm not gonna like that the skis don't feel really long and then I'm going to fall over and catch my outside edges. And it just frees the skis up. So you can, you have the whole ski for the, to use the side cut, but you're not, it doesn't feel like sketchy and, and uh, like speed wobbly. Okay. So now the rust is all gone and the edges actually feel okay. This is a pair of skis I'm just going to hop on next year to free ski or train or something. All my race skis are, are with my tech and most of my race skis are with my tech in Europe. So, so now I'm ending on this lighter stone just to kind of smooth them out. Okay. That's good for me. Just edge real quick. And this edge doesn't have very much uh, rest on it, so. One thing I want to add too is that when I'm tuning, when I'm done, every time that I'm done with a stone, I'm actually finishing on the top because if you finish on the bottom, like I said earlier, it'll create, it creates a little bit of, it takes away that hanger. So if, say if it's like the most aggressive snow of your life and you feel like you're going to crash, it's so aggressive then you would probably want to finish on the bottom, just like your last light pass. But 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, we'll finish on the top. And that just like, that just gives the ski that little bit of bite. And most everybody prefers, so. Okay, that edge is good. Now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna wax them real quick. I'm going to use, I always, I've had this brush for 15 years or so, maybe more. Um, and this is like one of my favorite brushes. This is just a, a brass and the brass is like the best thing to, to use right before you, right before you put wax in, because if you can use the big aggressive uh, steel ones, but they end up like taking, sometimes I feel like they just like dig the base up too much. So I've, this is usually the best way to go. So you use this one before and then uh, and then when you're when you're done and you're waxing them out after. But this kind of just gets all the dirt out. Jared, we got a question we got a question from Robert. Um, and maybe you know this. Uh, do different manufacturers use different material in their edges 
or is all the steel used the same? Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know too much about the manufacturers um, with the different metals. What I do know is that for a race ski, the edges are made out of like a much softer material. Um, that, like, they should be made out of stainless steel, right? Like, but it's. I don't know if it's too expensive or not. Um, but because I have, you know, I get rust on my skis, and that's why we gotta separate them when we're done. But uh, definitely, the race skis have a really soft uh, edge compared to like a powder ski. Like I have powder skis, I can. I can walk around on rocks and like barely have anything wrong with them. Uh, and you know, race ski, you can blow an edge out and you touch a little pebble. So, um, I think that they're like that so that you can tune them so easily. Cause if you ever tried to pull a uh, file on like a thick powder ski or a wide powder ski, you need like something like this, this is like a panzer. And, uh, this is like the only way that you can really get through those. So that's all I know about edges. Okay, so I'm gonna wax. Uh, I have this. I have some old eight, and like it's a little bit dirty. So I just took. I didn't fully do it yet, but just can take. Uh, just kind of scrape the the dirt off a little bit. It's not, and then it goes back to clean. And this is just like Swix eight. That's something something really easy to put on your skis it goes in nice and and uh it'll be something that'll just sit sit in there and keep them nice and hydrated because you don't want to put anything that's that's too cold like i have some blue here i'll show you in a second which is probably more like a swix six it's made by home Nicola. and i like to do uh figure eights and then do one down the middle and then sometimes i'll do like residual drip afterwards just really it's not it's kind of a bummer if you don't use enough and you burn your bases so so the first pass is trying to get trying to get everything warm i'm in a cold garage i'm in my garage so it's a little bit colder out here so i usually have to go a little bit hotter with the the iron And uh, for my first pass. And if anybody joined late, uh, you can feel free to ask any questions in the comments below. And Max is going to read them off to me. So it can be about pretty much anything. So, so ask away if you feel like it. It'll be about tuning, what my dog's name is. So now I'm, I'm too cold here. Jared, do you, uh, are there any um, natural or non floral waxes uh, that you'd recommend or that you've tried or used? You know, I don't, I, CH, <laughs> natural. Um, I don't, this year has been a lot different because I've, because now next year we're actually going to move to no fluoros. So it's all new to me, actually. Um, it was kind of funny. Uh, last year, during, you know, everything that was going on, the shit show in the world, um, they also were trying to get rid of fluoros, and all the technicians were flipping out because they've never in their whole, in their careers had to deal with something like that. So there was this machine that was in, in Germany that was supposed to be able to check the fluoros and all the technicians were going to have the opportunity to go and get them checked out and see like what the tolerance was because they were basically going to have to gr probably grind the skis and hot scrape them and to get all the you know as much fluoro as they can so all the the technicians were panicking and they ended up pulling the plug on it so we just it pushed everything back a year so now going into next year we're going to have there's going to be no fluoros next year which will be interesting because we've all of our skis have sometimes hundreds of wax cycles of fluoros and powder, floral powder. And 
So I can't, I don't know a brand that's uh, yet. I have heard, I think uh, Darren Rolves talks about a brand. I forget the name, but you can check out, check out his Instagram. I'm pretty sure he, there's some wax that he talks about. Jared, we got a question from Jim. Um, do you prefer sharpening uh, your edges by hand with stones or with an electric edger? I don't have an electric edger, so I would, I prefer uh, doing by hand. And we actually, probably almost everybody on the World Cup for speed does it by hand. The technicians do. It's more of a feel thing. Um, there's a select few that do do use the machine, but it just it makes what it does is it makes like if you think about skiing down the hill on a serrated edge, like it it's not going to grip perfectly, but it'll grip. And when you have when you have a perfect, so if it say it's like a hot, really hard compact snow, and you have a perfect edge that it doesn't have waves, because when you're pulling file, especially when you've tuned the skis a bunch. Like, and you look at it, it's going to have these little minor, minor waves that are, that are so minor. No, no, not, you can barely see them. You have to look down the edge, but believe it or not, that'll make the ski get, have a little bit of more forgiveness. So like if I have, I've had, I've tried it before. If I have downhill skis that have been tuned with a, uh, with an electric edger, it's crazy. It's like way too aggressive. So, um, I think for, if you're tuning, your skis and you can get one of those ones that are pretty easy. Like my, my dad actually has one that, that you can lay flat. I would say go for it for sure. Um, you know, it definitely will make your life easier and it's faster and you don't have to be quite as savvy at, at, uh, doing your edges. So I would say go for it because the technology now is pretty sweet, but for racing, it's only really for tech Solomon GS. Okay. So this edge is done. Or this key's done. Jared, uh, Jason Clark just uh, he just called social, so everybody uh, everybody watching can have a drink break. Oh, <laughs> mm. sounds good. Drinking tonight. Eight hundred one. You went to you went as one of my favorite breweries here in Salt Lake. Uh, Jared, we got another question um, from Ted. Uh, can you talk a little bit about base bevel, base bevel, and edge degrees again? Uh, he's an advanced skier getting into tuning his own skis. Sure. Uh, so the base. So here's the bit. Just for some people that don't know, the the base bevel is the degree out outwards that will determine how how aggressive your skis are going to feel. And then the side bevel, which is usually we just called the side angle of the, of the edge is up here. So that's say like a 90 degree would be here, 91 degree, 92, 93, 90. So you're just making the point. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but I'm trying here. Um, <laughs> instead of having a square edge, the more that you take off the side, it's going to make it pointier. And then when you take, when you add bevel, take a, so if you have less bevel, it's going to be like a real point. So for example, um, for slalom on the base bevel, a lot of guys will do 0.3 to 0.5, which is like insane to do on a, on a downhill ski, uh, for a GS ski will run 0.5 and then, uh, super G 0.75 downhill around one some guys will uh run like a a one and a half um a lot a lot of times actually our old downhill skis will get so beat up that and so skied in that the uh the bottom of the ski will actually wear away from the tuner tuning them and also from just the aggressive snow and ice so the they'll actually be almost uh base high and we'll just keep running them because they're so fast. So some sometimes you almost feel like you need more canting to, to get the ski to turn, but they're the skis just feel so good um, that they sometimes will just stick with with a one point four or something. But 
my powder skis, I have about a one. And uh, I think one is if you're doing race skis, like tech skis, I would say like 0.5 to 0.75 is good. And then for your powder skis, free skis, a one is probably good. That answers that question. Yeah, and kind of along that uh, same line, um, I don't know. I can't, I don't see this guy's first name, but he's asking um, any advice on the edge sharpening method. He can't seem to get a nail shaving edge. Um, okay. I'm wondering if that might be a sidewall thing. Do you, how often are you, uh, how often are you filing your uh, sidewalls? Um, yeah, you should have, they have a little tool. Actually, I got one right here. It's one of these. And uh, th this has like a little metal um, square right there. And right next to the edge, you have, you have a, it's like a, we call it the second edge. And then you have the base material. And usually, usually the ski has like way too much base material or side material, sidewall material. And then the second edge is there. So what you want to do is you want one of these so that you can pull that second edge. Because if you don't have that second edge gone, it's a little bit stronger metal. And what it'll do is the file can't get through it. So it'll start to angle down and it'll actually give you, it'll dull your edges. So that could be a reason that you don't have that bite. That's like, that's probably the most important tool to have in your quiver. So as you do this next one, we got a uh, tuning unrelated question, but um, Leonardo from uh, Chile wants to know when the next time you're going to be back. Back racing, you think? Back in Chile. Oh, back in Chile. Leonardo. Um, I hope this summer we're going to probably go in September. Uh, September. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably middle, no, sorry, middle of August, and then we'll probably go back in September. So that's uh, our plan, like our best case scenario is to go down there two times. And that way we can go starting, we like to start in La Parva, and then we go to like Portillo or wherever the snow is. Hmm. Okay, wax this puppy quick, and then I can get the next ski. We're thinking that most of our team is vaccinated now. We're working on their vaccination, so hopefully we can we can get down to Chile next year. That would be awesome. The, the where is where is your favorite place to uh, train in Chile? Um, my favorite place is definitely probably La Parva because it's got like a pretty moderate hill, but we can train full length downhill there and it's like one of those downhills that you can push out of the start as hard as you want and like really look for speed the whole way so it's not it's not the same as uh you know portillo is awesome as well but the hill in portillo is is more in your face so you can't you really can't relax it's a little bit kind of almost like it gets you ready for the winter but it's a little bit scary it's so steep um it's right. It's kind of like skiing. I don't know if anybody out there is no snowbird. It's like skiing regulator on downhill skis. Um, it's uh, it's what we need though to get ready for the World Cup season. So um, otherwise, yeah. Last year we went to Chion. That was pretty cool. And uh, and we spent some time down in Caralco as well. So Caralco is a really awesome area. So that place is really cool. That's down, uh, more down south, but it's right near the ocean. So they, I mean, gets a lot of snow. It's like a really cool region for touring, actually. My coach, Scotty Venus, has spent some time down there. And he said it's like been unbelievable for touring. Jared, we got a, uh, while you're doing, while you're waxing, this is kind of, is relevant. Um, Mike was wondering uh, if you use the brass brush every time you wax. 
Yes, I do. I uh, I use it like just to get, just because it's the most aggressive brush you can use. Uh, that's that's gonna pull out any dirt or any anything you have in the ski, but it's not it's not that aggressive. It's not like one of those big steel ones. I think the steel ones are a little bit kind of unnecessary sometimes. Um, but like if you do have a steel one, use it and you want to use it, use it before you wax and don't use it after. What it, what is the what's the purpose for that for people who maybe don't know? What's the purpose of brushing it before you wax? Uh it just pull pulls any old wax out you have and any dirt. Because when you're skiing, especially like you know, when it's hotter in, in the springtime and there's mel snow melting, where you really want your skis, the wax to like work, um, there's a lot of dirt and crap in the snow. So it makes them, you don't want to like put a hot iron back on that and wax it in. Makes it kind of, just kind of, it's not, you could get away with it on powder skis, obviously, but it just makes the wax go deeper in. You get out all the crap that sits on the on the top of the base, the microscopic dirt. Mm. Okay, so I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. I got my touring skis that I'm planning on doing some touring this spring. So I already waxed them, so I'm gonna save you that. And uh, basically, I'm gonna put a little P-Tex in it because I hit a a rock last time I went skiing did a really awesome tour up in uh, big cottonwood and I nailed a rock and it's okay because I'm gonna fix it um, I got some p tech that you can get from any any store and uh, what I want to use though is for this is um, one of these metal scrapers that you, you really only want to use for for when you're doing your a base weld like this and first i'm gonna just kind of go back and forth a little bit to bring it back down kind of i'll try to show you what it looks like but see that scratch right there that's what i'm gonna fix and it's it's pretty deep it's deepest right here so um make sure you do this in a ventilated area i'll do it I'll do that next time. Um, so let's, I'm gonna go with this. I got a little bit of P-Tex left, so I'm gonna use a uh, pliers here to start getting this. Of course, just takes a second. You gotta heat it up, get it dripping. While you're heating that up, uh, Bo wants to know what kind of vices you're using. Uh, these are like. 2002 beast vices <laughs> so still on the market they're really old i don't know if they're on the market actually um they, these are the ones i had as a little kid and then my dad started racing masters he's already and then he retired already but he raced masters for a couple of years and he and he took all my stuff to borrow and uh it's all at his place my parents place so I uh, I just have the the beast tuning set up, which is tried and true. Got it from Reliable Racing when I was about 12, probably. And it works just fine. So I think it proves that it doesn't really matter what you have. Um, I do have a, a home and cold middle part. So right now I'm just dripping it all the way down the line. And it'll it'll start to cool. And then I'm going to go back to the front, working my way down. I'm just really slowly here. How much are you overlapping those drips? Um, drip like drip. halfway. So ha like halfway in the, the drip of the circle. Um, and then I'm going to do probably three layers of this because it kind of sucks into the base. So I'm going to go back to the front. Now we're getting really, uh, okay. 
So I'm just gonna let that cool for a second, a few minutes. Um, right now it's looking thick and and still definitely molten. So I'm gonna let that cool, and then we're gonna go. I'm gonna wax my my core 93 and 189s, which I got last year. It's kind of it's fun for me to have all these different skis. These uh these core skis are actually really badass, sir. Um, they've had them for several years now. I think like four or five years at head, and they're pretty bomber actually. They're like they've been growing on me for sure. They they're like almost like a race ski and they're really light and like i'm not just saying that i've tried a lot of different skis and um, they're they're a pretty good ski this core 93 ski is like so money for like literally anything i think if i were to get one for everything it would be a 99 but the 93 is great for uh it's not that uh wide underfoot so you can like arc gs turns on these and you could and my touring skis are the 180 version so i mean i skied Two, two foot deep powder on with 9300 foot that the tip floats they're fine so um they're they've been like a really awesome ski so actually these are set up with the frame binding in case i want to go do a big line or something but uh yeah they've been fun for powder i use the 105s jared because your your uh, brass brush is a uh, is a popular item um his name isn't here, but Snowboard Realtor wants to know uh, what brand is that brush brass brush that you're using? Uh, this is Swix, and they they make the best brushes for sure. Um, so does it have what is he's he's specifically wondering about the material around the around the brass brushes? What are the what is that? Uh, it's nylon. So this is like a really good. If you're gonna have one brush, this is the brush to have, for sure. Um, I would use, like, it, I would use this brush, and then I would have, say, like a pretty aggressive uh, straight up nylon, and then maybe a horsehair. But if you just want one brush and you're tuning your powder skis or your free skis, like I would say, like you only need this and maybe a nylon to really shine them up. Um, you could also get one of those aggressive uh, steel brushes, not not a barbecue brush, which are the ones that are like uh, literally nails coming. Like those will ruin your bases. Those are only for like real professionals to use. Uh, but you can get like the more of a steel brush and that what that'll do is like just kind of pull a bunch of stuff out of your base. I don't think it's necessary. I think this is like a plenty good. Brush. This is what my favorite brush. This way. So my only brush I have here my house um so yeah so now these ones i don't really need to touch the edges because the edges are fine so i just i'm trying to just get these uh these are my inbound skis um probably not going to use these maybe not use these anymore so i'm just going to get them ready for the summer so they're looking really dry so i'm going to put a little wax on them and then i think for these um, yeah, I'll use this wax still. And then I have this, uh, this isn't even like a world, world cup, uh, iron or anything, but it's not bad. I waxed my downhill skis with it the other day. So that's like, if you wanted to get like a really good iron, uh, Swix makes this like if you get one of the race irons from Swix. I mean, those are the best ones that I've ever that I've ever used. Um, they have ones with like if you're doing a lot of skis all the time, I would get one the one that has a really thick base on it. It's like red and it's got like the bottoms like twice as thick. I mean, that's like the most badass one. And those ones you can just they they say the temperature and they say like you know if it's it keeps it like right exactly where you want it and it makes a really big difference. But for what I do here when I'm home, um, this one works just fine. And this is just like the cheapo winter sagger one. 
But yeah, when you're tuning, you don't you don't want to obviously have your your iron sticking at all. So I'm like always trying to keep it moving. So that the first pass, I'm just trying to you know heat everything up. Like I said, I'm in a cold garage. Yeah. Just trying to I'm doing like a round motion just to get the whole base. The uh, the powder skis are wider, so you have. The wax needs to go a lot farther. So I'm kind of getting it around. No need to really go all the way to the tail or tip. That's just a waste. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna like go a little bit slower here. Now it's like leaving a nice smooth trail behind it, which is kind of feels good. Jared. Um Mike wants to know, uh, what do you use for storage wax, or do you just, what, what specifically are you putting on skis when you put them away for storage? Um, I'm putting like a red, like a pink. So, like the ultimate stuff to use is, it's called Swix um, BP88. Base prep is like really good to put on your skis in the summer and it's cheap and it's it's kind of like it's similar to a beta it's called from just like the holy grail of waxes that we all love racers love waxing because it's like it's easy easy to wax and um it penetrates the base enough but it's not it's not a soft wax like if you were to wax say like a like a yellow like it just wouldn't really do anything it would be better than nothing but it wouldn't it's it just wouldn't when you scraped them in the spring it wouldn't or in the, sorry in the fall to race or to ski on them again um it just wouldn't really it would just like blow out in one run so this will actually like give your ski a little bit of like wax that'll stay in there for a while and then when i'm cleaning the edges it's like pretty important actually to take the side of your scraper and uh, put it on the base like this. So I'm holding it and that'll take off. You wanna take the wax off the edge on the top and the bottom. And the reason that you do that is because sometimes the wax will have humidity in them. And if you leave them, they'll rust. So just a good like habit. Every time you, every time you throw a layer of wax in, you do that really quick. Do, um, Drew wants to know uh, what happens if you burn your base? Is there a way to fix that? Have you ever done that? Yeah, you bring them to, you got to bring them to a shop probably and get them ground. It's kind of the only way. Um, you could maybe try to brush it out with a really aggressive steel brush, but um, yeah, probably going to have to. You're probably kind of screwed. <laughs> That's why you want to keep the iron moving. Okay. So I'm going back to the uh, the ski that I put a base weld on. But first, I got to take a sip of beer here because I'm thirsty. And if anybody has questions, ask away anything. Um, okay. So I got my my metal scraper now. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna flip this around actually so you can see better. I'm a lefty when I tune skis, but ready for everything else. So I'm gonna tilt it towards you guys, the tail's out over there. And I'm just gonna go lightly over this. So I'm, on, I'm trying to bring it down to, to even. Cause I had a pretty, probably like a two or three millimeter gouge. And like, that's going to be like sticky when I'm, when I'm out touring around and when you're trying to say like, get out of like the approach or whatever, trying to leave. So it's actually coming out really good now. Got it nice and smooth.
kind of going back and forth lightly, but not, not aggressive because you don't want to mess up the day. Okay. So now it's totally smooth, but you can see the edge, the, the edge of the, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but you can see like that it's not into the grind yet. The grind is everywhere else except where I dripped it and it filled in the grind. So now I want to take my trusty brass brush and kind of go at this puppy a little hard, harder than normal. Kind of bring back some of that, uh, that structure that we lost. And right now it's still warm, so you can do this. I mean, th this is when you would want, say, like one of those like stiff steel ones, a little bit stiffer steel. Do a little bit more and get it perfect. Okay, so now that that gouge is pretty much gone. It's like you can see where I did it right here, but um, it's totally filled in now. So it's going to be much better when I'm trying to go fast on my since I try to go so fast in my touring setup all the time. So watch out if there's ever a touring ski race, I'll. I'll be a real threat. Jared, um, I think I know the answer for you, um, but Michael's wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on using roto brushes? Does your World Cup Ski Tech use a roto brush? Yeah, roto brushes are awesome. Uh, they, I would totally wish I had one when I was younger. I never, none, my friends and I didn't really have one. I don't think they were really that big a deal yet. But I would say totally get one. Um, I don't know how much you would want to like use a brass roto because it, it's going to put a lot of wear on your edges. So you're going to have to like tune them after. But for sure, like the nylon one look, is saves you so much time. So I would say, hell yeah, brother, go for it. Bo, uh, Bo is wondering, how many days will you put on a pair of skis between having them stone ground slash a new base structure? How many days will I ski on them between, you said? Yeah, how many how many days will you put on a pair of skis between having them stone ground? Stone ground. Man, it, maybe the reason that you might do that is because you don't do a lot of uh, – edge tuning and, and I don't I don't know what you're doing obviously but I've I know that some people that go get their skis ground a lot maybe aren't doing all these things because if you if you're continuing to like wax your at your bases it's going to make them last longer and if you're keeping up on your edges it's also going to make them stay sharper longer and because it's like the farther the more days that you go and you don't tune your edges, the worse they get. And then they're like unsavable. So you need to go get a tune, get them tuned or get them ground. But I would say if you're like continually uh, keeping an eye on them and, and stoning them and keeping them good, that you wouldn't have to go as much. But I would say probably once a season is good. I wouldn't really, wouldn't really need to do it more than that. You know, maybe if you have like multiple skis in your quiver, maybe once a season, but otherwise, like I honestly haven't had skis ground in a long, I haven't needed to, but you know, obviously if you like hit a big rock and they're all scratched up, but I'd say watch out for rocks. Cause when you act, when you grind your, your skis, you're taking away, like if you go to a shop, like it's different, like a world cup, a world cup company will, We'll grind them so lightly. It's like you won't even, it won't do anything hardly except for take a micro amount off the top. But when you're bringing your skis in to an, a shop, they're taking a lot off. So it's actually going to make your base thinner and more susceptible to core shots and it makes them softer. 
So I would do everything you can to not have to get them uh, base ground. So these, these are really great. These ones are so wide that I have to kind of stay on one side of each ski. So I got to go down. I can't, the iron won't reach all the way across. So I'm doing, say I'm doing one side at a time here, kind of like a snowboard. If I go sideways, the iron's not uh, thick enough. So it doesn't, doesn't do as good of a job with this iron that I have. While you're uh, waxing that ski, um, Kevin's wondering, uh, what does an Olympic year look like for you? Is there Are there any differences in training or prep plans? Um, you know, we, our World Cup years are so demanding as it is. I don't think – we don't really ramp up anything different, really. Um you know, we have Kitzbühel and like Vengen and stuff. So we're like, we're already, those almost are like as more, maybe more important to us than the Olympics. But um, I think, I think the organization definitely ramps up. Like everybody's talking about it and it's like, it, there's, everyone's looking forward to it and chatting about it constantly. Um, so it definitely changes. Maybe you're, you know, maybe feeling like you should try a little bit harder because it's an Olympic year in the gym, say, uh, trying to get as strong as you possibly can. Um, but yeah, it's what I, I've been to, been to two Olympics and it wasn't really a big change that year, actually, other than all the hype, you know, which, which some people can get distracted with and kind of anxious because it's like there there is way more hype and they're asking you questions throughout the year like you know in interviews and stuff you have the olympics coming up yada 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 but you know we all kind of joke we're like well kids you know how about kids feel and how about you know so we're lucky that we have you know as opposed to say like bobsled or curling or something where um we have like big events already throughout every other year and throughout the year so we just pretty much do the same thing. Have we, but definitely more media attention, especially in, when we're in Colorado uh, doing our last training camp. We have much more media attention then. So would you rather have an Olympic gold medal or Kitzbühel downhill? I mean, like if it's not if it's not all about money, then I would say Kitzbühel downhill because. Kitzbühel is Kitzbühel, and and I think that it, if you don't really care about the money per se, then it that that's just one of those things that you can cross off your li badass things that you do in your life list. And I think that's probably like we will all say the same thing. I think is they're really it's really a tough question. Um, the Olympics are sometimes on hills that are not necessarily the most demanding or sometimes they're weird. Like the last Olympics was, was not very steep and it was slow feeling. And it was like, there was like lots of headwinds and like, it just, sometimes it feels a little like not as uh like it could be anybody's day kind of, you know, not like who's the actual fastest sometimes. So, but it seems like it's feel usually says who's got the most balls and um, who has the most, who's like the, one of the best guys. So I think kids feel maybe. Like I said, maybe I'm like 80, 20, but. <laughs> Tom's got a question for you. Um, how much free skiing do you get during a World Cup season? Just powder days or do you try to mix it into training? Well, uh, we, we don't get to free ski a ton, um, which is why anytime I'm home, I'm free skiing at my home mountain snowbird. Uh, but yeah, when I'm home, I'm like straight up to the mountain powder skis and trying to just get off the race skis as much as I can and off the trail. And I really like hitting cliffs and 
hitting jumps and just like being off piece is like what I grew up loving. And that's what I, that's like my, I'd compare it like to a completely different sport from racing. Um, I will go up and free ski a little bit on race skis when I'm home, but like in the springtime, I've just been going powder skiing. And like, that's for me, that is like what I've been looking forward to all year. Uh, so yeah, free skiing, I feel like is the, the biggest thing that keeps me sane through the year. I do definitely like racing, but when you're racing only and every day, uh, it can become a little bit of a grind. So when I'm in Europe and if there's like a downhill day canceled or something, we've, we've had some really epic days. I, at Lenzer Hyde actually at World Cup finals, which ended up getting canceled. Uh, one of my, our PT, Ben and I ended up going out and powder skiing and it was so much fun. It was like knee deep and nobody was powder skiing. It was like all untracked. And like that kept me motivated through the end because we didn't know if the races were canceled or if they were going to happen or what. So yeah, free skiing is like going surfing for me. It's like my favorite thing when I'm, it's what I'm going to do when I'm older and when I'm like, so free skiing is awesome. And it's good for your racing too. Um, something, so something else I'm wrapping up here pretty soon. Uh, so if anybody has any last minute questions or anything, ask away, but I'm going to talk about something I did on my touring boots last year. That was pretty cool. So a lot of touring boots. These are the head dual flex smart frame touring boots. I don't know if they're called the core as well. Um, but these are their touring boots and they're, re they're really not any much different than any other company's touring boots, uh, in terms of the flex. Uh, a lot of these companies will make, they'll use a different plastic and they'll make them a lot thinner. And they're gonna make them lighter because they're all competing against each other. Like who can be the lightest? Totally understandable. Um, they feel a little bit soft for me. I'm a racer, as you know. I'm in race boots all year that are probably 160 to 180 flex, depending on how cold it is. Um, but yeah, they. I'm used to having like a lot of like meat to my boot where. I can flex on it and it's going to stop. It's not going to fold. So whenever I'm in a touring boot, I feel like I'm going to die. No, it's not necessarily, but um, I feel like I'm going to go over the handlebars and I just don't necessarily feel totally comfortable having a boot that is, is soft. And, and you're also, you're sweating for two hours up. Like there's no, it's really hard to make a plastic that can withstand your foot sweating for two hours. Like it just, so anyway, th this can help a lot of people, especially if you, if you're heavier and, and if you feel like your boots are a little bit too soft, uh, when you turn around and go down. So I actually, one cool thing I did, and this is like, obviously like the last resort is I took a, uh, I took a ski boot. I took an old race boot I had and I cut a piece out from right here. So I cut that piece out and then I flipped it around and I can put it into the cuff right where it bends. So I can fit this in. Right like that. And what it does is it just adds like a little bit more meat into the, into the, where it flexes. And like, for me, it's been quite a game changer. And I literally just chuck this thing in here when I'm about to ski down and just makes my boot not fold. Right. So that's been really awesome. Um, I just put it in my backpack and throw it in when I'm done or when I, when I get to the top, I'm done hiking. Um, another cool thing that I took something off my race boots actually my old race boots and this is a piece of carbon and uh this this makes the back of the boot not flex as much so i've kind of done everything i can uh to stiffen these up and i would say now they're like good to go they're sweet um 
Uh, so yeah, you could probably figure out how to make something like this out of like, I was actually thinking about using like a Home Depot, uh, one of those orange cans, plastic cans or something, um, buckets and cutting out this shape and just it's whatever you put on the back of this boot is going to make the boot flex less. Cause like this, when you're flexing the boot, the, the back is going to go a little bit like this. And then the boot is going to bulge right here. So what I've done is because by putting this piece right here, it makes the boot, it kind of gives me a little bit more um, like sturdiness right here. So it's not going to be able to bulge as much because I have a little bit I have that lever right there adding extra material. And then I got this back. So it's not going to feel like it's got that really quick um, flex to the top of the cuff. And this is something that guys try on the world cup and I've never, I've never like really liked it. I've tried it here and there, but I really like it on my touring boots. So what do you know? Um, but something like the easiest thing that you guys could do if, and this is on your touring boots or your, um, any boots really is you can mess around with the booster strap. So these are like the only thing I use. Um, they're you've probably seen these before um, in a ski shop, but there's multiple different types of these that I don't think people really like pay attention to that much. And <clears throat> I obviously went for like the stiffest I could possibly get on, on these boots. Right. So this one doesn't flex at all. This is just like the head world cup race boot booster. doesn't flex, not even a little bit that thing. When I flex my shin forward, it's the whole boot is going to be, is going to be moving with it. So that'll make the boot the stiffest I could possibly make it. Um, sometimes these booster straps, they have different flexes. So like this one has uh, three layers and two stitches. So this is like something that you might find probably as the most stiff booster that you can get at a shop most likely they might say it's like the world cup one or something. And, uh, so this is sewn two times and then this one has some pretty good give to it. So if you're trying to soften a boot, then you should put something like this on and this will give the boot a little bit of flex forward. And like some, like if I put this on my boots, I feel like I'm going to fall forward because I, it's not stiff enough for me and that's on my race boots. So, um, the second thing you can look at, this is the world cup one and this is uh three layers and it's sewn all the way through. And this one has a little bit of give, but not much. And, uh, this is like probably the, if your boots are like a hair too stiff, then take off what the Velcro one you have, and then you could put one of these on and they should be good to go. The, uh, like this is the one that they all come with usually. And then this does not flex at all. This is like a straight up rope around your ankle, which is what the boot is intended to have on it. It's intended to have something that doesn't flex at all. That's how the boots are designed. But um, you just want to be able to, you know, it's just like, uh, like on a mountain bike or something, if you're trying to adjust your stem length or your seat post and stuff, like these are just ways that you can, that you can take an existing boot without having to cut it and very simply, you know, make it softer. So, I mean, the first thing I would do is like mess around with the boosters. It's like the easiest thing. Um, go with a little bit of stretchy one, you know, if they're really way too stiff, like get this really stretchy one with only two times sewn through. They even have one that's even flimsier than this one. And that would probably be like the last one you could go down and then you got to cut your boot or you got to, um, so anyway, that's, uh, I think all I got for you guys. Um, Jared, we got some questions on, okay. I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're going to scrape your skis tonight, but, um, what is yeah. your plan for scraping? When do you scrape? What are you waiting for? What, what's your, um, plan behind that in your reasoning? Um, yeah. 
you want you want to scrape your ski probably at least 30 minutes after you've after you've waxed it um i think that's fine i did that for my downhill races the other day and it was totally fine so i think like for a race ski though like the the best is a few hours or overnight uh and that way it just you just let it go all the way as deep as it'll get into the bay the base and then it hardens and it'll um it'll you'll get the most out of it but i would say like 30 minutes to an hour is totally fine uh to start scraping them and uh scraping it scraping the ski i just uh i want to I'll, I'll show you like one more trick actually get rid of these puppies if you're ready to scrape one feel free and do it yeah um let me see what i Okay, I can actually, I'm gonna be using these when I go to Mammoth. So I can just scrape this real quick. Invest in a good set of rubber bands. You never go wrong with that. These are the best. Okay. So, um, let's see where my scraper is. So I'm gonna show like a little trick. That's kind of cool. So you can either there's like different ways. This is a Panzer file, and uh, I'm gonna take my scraper and you might have seen the uh the devices for going back and forth like this but i just like to put them so you guys can see me over here uh, i have a vice over here and i can just i like like to put it flat and just go so i like to sharpen it like that Trying to keep it like 90 degrees and not, you don't want it to like bow in the middle that bad, but just to kind of make it sharper so that I can quickly do this. Um, always tilt your, your scraper towards the tail as opposed to some people go like this and they'll hold it the opposite way and it's, it's not good for them to do that all the time. Kind of like... What it'll do is it'll take away too much base material. So now I'm just going. I'm in a tight quarter, so I got to move this thing all the time. But yeah, this ba the base prep just comes up so nice. It's unbelievable wax. Jared, is there any is there any difference or thought behind uh, tuning in a warm environment versus a cold environment? Yeah, if you're a World Cup tech, then warm. If you're anybody else, doesn't matter. I would say don't be. It, it really doesn't matter for other than for comfort. Sometimes, like our guys will tune in, in really cold basements and with heaters they always like to get it really warm the, the ski will definitely take in the most wax if it's warm like if you're in a negative well if you're in like a 30, 20 degree garage it's gonna be much harder for the the wax won't go in it won't penetrate as well Speaking of tuning in a cold area, uh, shameless spider plug, Kieran's wondering uh, what the hoodie you're wearing is called. What's the what? What the what? What you're wearing? What are you wearing? Oh my hoodie. hoodie. What? What's it? I don't know. It's I called, it's called the Vista hoodie, but can you talk about it? Yeah, this is uh, this is my new favorite hoodie I got. It was uh, given to me few months ago a couple months ago up in deer valley 
and it's it's awesome it's really it's like sometimes extremely warm and uh it's really comfortable to wear it's like the so like re perfect throw on hoodie for doing all just about anything so i approve of this hoodie it's one of those like instant favorite hoodies you know when i un unboxed it i just knew i just it was love at first sight okay so i have gotten this down like pretty much all the way so now i'm going to use my brush my own my one only one brush i'm just trying to go down the middle here trying to get if you're trying to do this like legit or say a race or something you want to brush them until every time you push you don't see any white powder or any wax left i like to do like sections like at first say like Maybe four, four down, and then I do three, and do another three. It's kind of all feel, um, and then do like some full length ones at the end. Then I want to make sure that. I got all the wax off the edge, which I didn't do as good a job the other day. So you can take, you can either take your scraper or take the top of your, this is almost like better because some it bends and it's got nice round corners so you can get right near the edge. So just the top of your, uh, your wax cap there works well. You just gotta get all that wax off because it, whenever you're making a turn, like the sidewalls are actually super, important um like a down if you have slow sidewalls on a downhill ski they're like you're getting last like they're not unless it's like bulletproof ice and you're not even digging in but most of the time like you need you need fast sidewalls and uh some guys have even like the comp some companies have developed wax for the sidewalls um just to like, because when the ski's on edge, like it'll dig into the snow. And if you have a really grippy sidewall, it's like crazy slow. So, um, where our techs will spend a lot of time with sandpaper. First, they'll run them through a machine at the factory. And the factory will actually like take it down a little bit flatter. Like in that space, you know, saves the guy's time with this tool, like I was saying earlier. Um, they'll take the the sidewall down a little bit and then afterwards they'll go with sandpaper you know probably start at 100 grit and and or less and then they're going to work their way up to like make them really smooth almost like mirrors and that way they're uh they can glide through the snow so yeah we wax our sidewall sometimes okay so those are done uh question on your brushing how hard are you pressing down are you giving it full force are you giving it kind of medium force what can you describe that yeah you're just it's kind of like medium um i i think like there was a place on the base where i where i didn't quite have all the wax taken out and so i could either go back to a scraper or i could just push a little bit harder there and like dig it out but um i'm pushing like very very moderate like you don't want to like bend the bristles in half you know you want to just like have them like halfway compressed i guess um or like a quarter compressed and that way like you want to just see wax coming out you don't want to be too light you want to be you don't want to be way too hard so like right in the middle right what feels normal is totally fine um check your edges when you're done sometimes uh if you brush a whole lot, it's a good idea to maybe hit the ski with like your thousand again. So 
go back over it just do like a nice pass like top and bottom so uh sometimes you know if you you're doing your skis and you're like oh they feel so sharp and then you wax them afterwards and then you scrape them and with the scraper and all the brushes running over the edge is going to kind of dull them a little so just finish them off with a with a thousand or the 600 or a thousand um and it'll just like increase the it'll give you that little bit of a bite on the edge again and then they, they'll be good to go like we always for races pretty much always do that is that a file or is that a diamond stone what is that this is a uh, diamond stone very very smooth diamond stone and these are the, the other ones i was using these are like the best these are called uh Moonflex 600. I would start if you were to go out and buy them, you know, I'd have the 200 for like, if you have like, like, like I had earlier rust, you know, or uh, like your powder skis, if you're trying to just get really big chunks off or big divots out of the edge. Um, but yeah, usually a 400, 600, and then a really smooth, a thousand is all you need. These three are like the money because you can use the 400 to get out stuff as well. So the, the 200 so is just, yeah, a backup. For for people who are looking, we can kind of hit the whole spectrum. What would you say for people who want to tune at home to get a good tune on their skis? What's the bare minimum equipment they need? Yeah, the bare minimum is uh, like red wax, like something like a base prep um, by Swix. Like it's like you could probably get. Um, CH7 is probably the best, like all around wax to have CH7 or CH8. Uh, you could get get one of the sidewall. It, okay, that's not the bare minimum. Um, I would say get a, uh, a file. You need a you need a file, and you need those three stones. I, and this is just like a, a smaller. This is a bastard file actually, which is a little bit more aggressive than. Uh, a regular file but um all you really need is this file the three stones a scraper and uh the rest i mean you, you kind of need all this stuff and you buy it once and then it lasts forever i've had this for like 20 years but you know like i said a 92 degree for your powder skis is totally fine 92 um and then for your say gs skis slalom skis more like a 93 um one of these little clips <laughs> but yeah otherwise uh yeah and the as far as for brushes like i said earlier um the brass brush is like really all you need and then you could get a nylon as well and that would be totally fine um for like world cup skis you know they got they got that one nylon horse hair and then sometimes a really really fine like finisher brush which is a polisher and that makes them look really shiny after but that's unnecessary for just a regular um skier that doesn't need not doing their downhill ski so um yeah and then like a pretty like cheap, the cheapo irons are kind of hit or miss this one is decent though this is a winter sagger uh, it was like the $50 one and it's, it's decent. It works. Uh, it's got a little bit of a thicker base, but the more money that you spend on an iron, the better quality you're going to get when you're like, if you're really trying to like leave behind like a perfect puddle with no imperfections, like, which is always really nice when you're tuning, uh, then you're just, you got to fork it up a little bit for the nice iron. But um, like, this is all, I mean, I would say my setup here is the most, similar to like your average show that they might have around so which is i think perfect for this kind of this kind of like show or whatever then you know um because this is not this is stuff i've just kind of like thrown together and it works and it's totally fine it's some of it's dull and you just you make it work uh but yeah all my edges are feel really good um with what i have so you don't need the top of the line stuff you can just get the basic stuff and and if you maintain your edges and your bases you're not going to have to go get your skis. You're not going to spend money at the shop as much uh, 
and it's also like fun to do you can drink a beer and do your skis and like kind of zone out it's kind of like mowing the lawn it's a little bit it's like a it's peaceful so um yeah i recommend that people you know take good care of their skis and and make them last longer and then you have like yeah it feels good to be out there skiing around on skis that you tuned and and you can adjust the tuning a little bit and you can say like oh like this my head just feels so good today and and i i made this happen so yeah that's that's all i got anything else max no i think that's it um thanks for the info i think a lot of people actually came away with some really good stuff so right on um yeah that's all i got and uh hope everybody has a good spring and get some good spring skiing in and touring and and whatever and and summer mountain biking type season baby so <laughs> hope everybody has a good one all right thanks everybody we're signing off okay good night everyone bye